This time on the show, animals need no justification. Ducks should not eat turkeys. And I guess it could be worse. He could turn into a boat. All this and more on Comics Are Great. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live Wednesdays at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, drawing comics, writing comics, designing characters, building worlds, uh, managing one's business as a, a cartoonist, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey, Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, I am so excited to have him here, and I can't believe it's taken this long to get him here. i got John Patrick Green on the show. Hey, John. Hey, how's it going? How long have we known each other now? And it took until now for me to get oh, you on the show. Like, I don't know, 100 years. It uh, feels like it sometimes. Long, I long time. <laughs> the John, John Green of johngreenart.com. And, and I noticed in, uh, with your new book coming out uh, yes. next year, uh, the, the blogosphere has been calling you John Patrick Green. And gosh, I wonder why you started using your middle name. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's not necessarily a requirement. I guess it's it's really just the publisher's preference uh, at this point. Um, the thing is, is there there are plenty of John Greens. It's an extraordinarily common name. There's the heck you say. I, I just moved. There was a, another John Green that lived on my same block in my previous part of Brooklyn. So when I would go to vote, there were, you know, they would always ask me, which one am I? <laughs> I just moved a year ago. And when I voted just like a couple of weeks ago, there was still another John Green in the district. Wow. <laughs> when I changed districts. Um, <laughs> but there are a bunch of other John Greens that are artists. That There's one that does nature art, like paintings of ducks yeah. and stuff. Um, but the funny thing is, is that the publisher apparently had a conversation where like part of their sales team is like, no, we should, we should not use his middle name. It should just be John Green Yeah. because then people might pick it up thinking it's by the other John Green. And then, yeah. you know, I, I'm kind of like, whatever, you know, <laughs> it's, it's fine. Well, <laughs> would, would, would we're, the... we're aware of each other at this point. The other John Green. Oh, there. is he? Okay. Uh, well, it, it, we should say johngreenart.com is the website. John Green Art on Twitter. On uh, Twitter, yeah. But uh, you're the John Green who is behind a book that I've talked about a lot on this show, Teen Boat. And for yes. many, many months, the Teen Boat poster was behind me when we ah. would record these shows. And this is uh, a story about, well, I, I would describe, okay, here, here's the, the log line or uh, what am I trying to say? Book talk, one sentence review I would give of it. Uh, that I was working on this morning was it's as if you took Doug, the old cartoon show, and mixed it with Turbo Teen, the okay, English cartoon yeah. show. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that sounds fair. I, I still I, I think Turbo Teen is is still pretty obscure for most people. Yeah. Um, but definitely Doug, you know, the whole the whole everyday teenager kind of conundrums. Uh, just mixed with like I I, I kind of compare it to Spider Man in some ways at least when Spider Man was a teenager because yeah. having this power that is you know that he doesn't know what's the best way to use it and and you know it's just instead of having spider powers they're boat powers <laughs> uh, and it's not a secret you know like his name was Teen Boat right like, you know every, everyone knew. Or he even exhibited his boat powers. Yeah. <laughs> I that's one of the things I love about the book is that you guys play to all the absurdities of superhero storytelling and just celebrate it through the story. Oh, yeah. Right? It's, instead of saying like, okay, this is a trope that we have to observe because after all, that's the way superhero stories work. You're like, well, not only is it a trope, but we're gonna hang a lampshade on it and say, hooray for this trope that you know that. Uh, and even make it more absurd by having his name actually be Teen Boat. Uh, I know we've told the story when Dave Roman has been on the show before, but I want to hear it from you, the story of how this book came to be, because uh, it, I think the thing that this points to is that there's no such thing as a bad idea, <laughs> right? So, like, you and Dave were just, like, talking about cartoons one day, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it pretty much started on a bus trip. Uh either to or from small press expo in uh, Bethesda, Maryland from New York, which is like, you know, a four or five hour bus trip or six, if they stop for like lunch or something. Um, 
and uh, we were talking about cartoons or something. It was a kind of joint conversation between cartoons because Dave had a bunch of old animation magazines and and just like on his person in general. Did he have these magazines on his person on the bus? Yeah, he brought them to read on the bus. Like there is like maybe three or five of them, just a whole bunch of animation magazines. <laughs> um, and we were also talking about the the small press scene in general. Now this was like the year two thousand or something, um, and uh, we were kind of talking about how there seemed to be a lot of a lot of indie comics that either seemed pretentious or didn't seem to have a lot of actual content to them. And yet they would get a lot of praise and stuff. Um, and we just thought it would be funny. Like and we just thought that we, we hung on to this concept of, you know, you can make something out of any idea, no matter how kind of mundane the idea might be. Um, and during this, like Dave is reading this magazine, this animation magazine that's mentioning all these obscure cartoons. Um, and I think in a letters column, someone mentioned Turbo Teen. Um, Which was a show about a kid who, if water got splashed on him, I think. Was that what it was? He when would, he got hot, that's he what would it was. turn into a car. <laughs> um, and, and Dave, like, Dave never heard of this show. And he was like, that sounds awesome. That sounds like a, <laughs> who, what kid would not want to be a car? And, and I was insistent that it was, it was horrible. It was like, it was not a good show. And that, you know, and, and like, and I think I probably said it was a bad idea. And Dave was like, no, it's not a bad idea. That's a great idea. You know, the execution is what was wrong. Yeah. And, and I said, well, I suppose it could have been a dumber idea. It could have been a teen boat. And they was like, no, that's a great idea too. And and then and it just it it kind of snowballed. I was like, well, maybe if it was a cool boat, like a cigarette boat, you know, like those those long speed boats. And Dave is like, no, no, any boat, any boat would be cool if a kid could turn into it. And, uh, and I was like, and I literally said, yeah, but what would it be about? The angst of being a teen and the thrill of being a boat? Like that was. The tagline was ding, the ding, 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 ding. dialogue that I just said. And that is actually <laughs> on the cover of the book. And and Dave was like, this is hysterical. And we just laughed at it. And, you know, it's, it's hard to remember the specifics, but, but we, we recall, like, telling our friends at that year's convention about the idea, and everyone thought it was funny. And so it was like a year later, like just over the summer that we were like, oh, let's do a mini comic for Small Press Expo. Like we were selling Jack's Epic, the Quick and Forbiddens at Small Press Expo. And we were like, let's do something different, like totally not like what we do. And originally Dave wanted me to draw it like Tintin. Like we were going to make it like super kind of feel European and a little like, you know, um, just a different, like not American in a way. Um, but, but I couldn't get the, really the hang of that. I was like, you know, I, I've been forced to draw specific styles a lot of times. And, you know, after doing it for a while, they, they they just don't come naturally anymore. They just feel forced and stuff. So I was like, I'm just going to draw it, you know, without thinking about it. Um, and then that's, that's how the first mini comic came came out and then people really liked it and we kept doing it and there you go and now we've got this book from clarion uh yes. boat and book two is coming out you you just wrapped on that recently did you not Team boat uh two? just about there are 13 pages left to color ah. um so so it'll be done by new year's basically you know it'll be done by by early January. Like it's done. Everything else is done. Just coloring it and turning it into the publisher. And then when, what's the street date on that? Do you know? Um, it's supposed to be fall of next year. So fall 2015. Sweet. It's supposed to be when it comes out. I'm, I don't know precisely what day. I'm jazzed. I got to, I, I got to look over the shoulder of uh, Rachel Polk while she was flatting some of the pages. Ah, yes. 
and I got to see some of the stuff that's going to happen in this book, and it looks really good. It looks really, that's <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about your stuff too. That if people aren't familiar with your work, John, I mean, it's like you do not you do not back away from uh, an intense scene. Like, I mean, not intense in terms of like the emotional drama or conflict or whatever, but like here's a hundred boats in the water and there's a whole bunch of people on each one of those boats and you draw it all and it's crystal clear <laughs> and super crisp. And I remember saying this to you at SPX a couple years ago and I was looking at some of the original pages from Team Boat and like you get up close and it's like, oh my God, you know, it's, the stuff is just super. I can see like the, the Tintin direction you were heading with that, uh, whether or not you were really trying to get there. Um, it's just really, really crisp and just gorgeous pages, man. But uh, also, we should say that you also worked on this thing, and I pulled this out. Yes. I, I found this at a at a used bookstore uh, about six months ago. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Was, I don't know. I was surprised it held together. It's it's still a good shape, uh, although it, it does seem a little bit loved in places. But uh, yeah. so Jack's Epic and the Quick and Forbidden. It was originally just called Quick and Forbidden. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but that one recently got collected, or it's getting collected. Um, I it's getting collected. As far as I know, um, I mean, Dave and I both kind of have to follow up and see what's happening because, you know, there's been a lot of playing the wait and see game. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've we've both in, been in situations with with a variety of publishers that are like, oh, I love your work. I, I'm really interested in this. I want to put it out or whatever. And then years go by. Yeah. And you're kind of like, I really wanted to just have this out the door. So, so I don't know, like, I know there are people interested in, in collecting it, but it's the, the final book. So the, there are three, technically three volumes, um, that were, you know, 13 single issues and it was originally a 15 issue series, but after doing issue 13, we decided to just do the final two issues for the collection instead of, you know, cause we were self-publishing. So it's like, why are we going to spend an extra like $2,000 to put out these final two issues when we could just put it in the trade and, you know, not, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm kind of like, I want it to come out soon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if we have to do it ourselves, then, then so be it. But um, as a you know, guy, hopefully it will see the light of day one way or the other. As a guy who's, who, uh, you know, worked in the what, direct market publishing for a little while, did a lot of web comics, and is only recently in the trade book market uh, now. Uh, I am astonished by how much waiting goes on. There is a lot of waiting when you work in traditional trade publishing. Uh, holy moly. So, yeah, totally understand. <laughs> Speaking of waiting, we got to wait till next year for your newest project. This is your first book that you're writing and drawing all in your because you've done let me, let me just establish your credentials quickly you worked on disney adventures comics you had to draw kim possible comics that's awesome yes one of the best superhero comics or uh, cartoons of all time uh you work on phineas and ferb uh done a whole bunch of different uh dreamworks comics so you know your stuff you've been around the block and now you're doing your first self-published thing called <laughs> pronounce well, it for me john <laughs> <laughs> how do you say it Hippopotamister. Hippopotamister, yes. So Hippopotamister, which is coming out from First Second Publishing. Awesome. Yes. Pixar of comics. Uh, what, what's what's Hippopotamister about? Uh, well, it's about a hippo um, who lives in a rundown zoo. And um, his his neighbor, the, the, the animal that lives in the habitat next to him, is a red panda. And the red panda gets fed up of being in this rundown zoo that's like falling apart and no one's coming to visit and stuff. So the red panda decides to leave the zoo and get jobs amongst the humans. Um, and, he come, and he comes back, and the hippo is like, wow, it seems like you're having like, a great time being out there and being a human. Uh, and so the red panda is like, well, you should, you should join me. You can be hippopotamister, and you know, we'll go out into the world of the humans. Uh, and so they do that, and they get all these bunch of jobs. Uh, which the hippo is good at and the red panda is horrible at and constantly gets them fired. Um, <laughs> and over the course of learning these things, the hippo, you know, didn't, has this, you know, it's a journey of self-discovery and he, he learns what he's good at and what he likes to do and where he wants to be in his life. And, uh, and it's a story of friendship 
Yeah, it's and a buddy. It's all a buddy those story. sorts of good things. <laughs> it's a buddy story with animals doing people things, which is the title that of this is episode. True. And I wanted to dig at this with you because you wrote uh, an essay on the uh, Geek Dad blog. Yes. Uh, it's at geekdad.com. People can find it. And it's about animals being the best protagonists. Yes. And you had a lot of, I thought, interesting arguments for why they make the best protagonists. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'll just let you take the lead on this because uh, it seemed like you're, you have, your thinking's crystal clear. If I s- throw you, and, and let me say also, John, this is your first time on the show. Often I like to play devil's advocate to dig at a topic. Okay. When I when I do that, you know I am on your side, right? Because uh, Boulder and Fleet, everybody, I love animals doing people things. Oh yeah, uh, I'm totally on your side. But I want to dig at this topic as best we can. What's so great about animal stories? Because um, you know, uh, superhero stories are realistic, and Zack Snyder has shown us that realism is, you know, the ultimate. Uh, apotheosis of fictional storytelling. So, why are you regressing? Why? Why? What's the big deal with these animals with you know walking around cutting people's hair and stuff? Well, I think that's that's uh, like I, I feel like you're proving the point, <laughs> uh, which is that you take you take superheroes, which for a long time had been this fantasy and this this trend of grounding them and bringing them to earth and making them suffer, you know, very human problems. And, you know, and people constantly questioning, well, like in the real world, you know, this is how Batman would be, or this is how this person would be or whatever. The lightsaber uh, thing. Let's do right. The lightsaber thing. Everybody's been talking about (laughs) that won't work. You're like, all right. Yeah. And, you know, which, which is kind of fine. Like the, yeah. the notion of, oh, let's take this fantasy element and make it more real. Yeah. Um, that, that, that can be plenty appealing. Um, but with, with, with animals, you're just, you're basically just doing the opposite, which is you're just by doing that, you don't have to acknowledge any human elements if they don't fit the story or the characters. You know, so instead of like you watch, um, you know, this this Star Wars trailer or whatever, and you question the lightsaber or you watch Batman and you question the economy, like, you know, the last Batman movie, there's this whole big thing about crashing the stock market and, and then, oh, no, Wayne Enterprises goes bankrupt overnight. And it's like, that's not how it would work in the real world. So the fact that they've grounded it in the real world so much only just makes you question it more. Um, and then you take, you take animals and you're like, Oh, I'm going to do, you know, the secret of Nim or watership down or animal farm or Charlotte's web. And the only human issues you have to deal with are the ones that are very, very focused, uh, into the narrative. Um, you don't have to, you know, you watch secret of Nim, And you don't have to think really about like, well, what kind of economic structure does this society have? You know, how does, how how does that work? Um, And uh, so it, it, it adds this freedom that you can have animal characters doing animal like things and they don't get questioned for it. And then you can have them doing human things and you don't say, well, wait, that's not how it works in the real world. Uh, the same way that you would if you're watching, um, you know, super superheroes that are now in this gritty real environment, and you know something happens where it's like, oh, you know, you're showing the Spider-Man movie, and the kids are taking the bus to school in New York City. Kids don't take the bus to school in New York City; they take the subway. You know, like <laughs> so. All, so all it, those things like that. What I'm hearing is, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that the fact that they're animals kind of builds in a disarming feature. It disarms you from feeling like, all right, let's prove to me that this is a story about such and such. It it sort of says like, okay, well, uh, how charming animals doing people things. Now I know not to expect, you know, uh, a, 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 a... an instantly rational story, right? Or, well, ra- rational in the sense of the world, right? Um, I think of I think of the movie or the, the cartoon series Shirakumo Cafe. Have you ever watched that, John? It's an anime. And it's it's about uh, a panda 
who uh, his, he lives in a house with his mom, and she's using a vacuum cleaner. And you know, he's like, and she's like, "You got to get a job." And he's like, "I don't want to get a job." And she forced him to get a job. And his job is to go be at the zoo and just sit there at, like a panda and let people squeal over how cute he is. And then when when he's done with his job, he goes to this cafe that's run by a polar bear. And but yet the, he, the polar bear has a human waitress who works for him. And the, and when Panda's at the the zoo, there's like a human zookeeper that he talks to. You know, like the zookeeper is like, "Oh, Panda, what, are you getting off early today? Yeah, I'm gonna go to the cafe." Uh, so like it does this really weird balancing. Whenever I'm describing the show to people, it's like I try to I get stuck on this balancing act that they strike between. The animals are kind of people, but they also behave like animals because his job is to be a panda sitting at the zoo so people can look at him. But then he goes out and rides bikes and goes eats bamboo at the cafe, right? So, but I didn't go, when I walked into that show, I didn't go like, what is this? This doesn't make any sense. It's just like, I took it, I was I was disarmed. I was charmed by the fact that there's like a cute yeah. panda in a cafe, right? I, I wonder if that, has, like, if that ties into like, the power of the cartoon too. Like when, like, at least for me, I can watch Justice League Unlimited, and it makes a lot more sense to me than when I watch like real superhero people superhero movies, right? I don't know. Well, Justice League Unlimited is also just written a lot better than the movies. <laughs> I mean, I, I think also, you know, when you when you take the source material of of a comic of comics that come out like once a month and are telling the, these kind of long form stories where you have a lot of character development and, and interactions between characters um, that translates better to the, that TV, the TV, TV show format than, than a movie that's going to constantly be, Oh, well, what's the best story about this character? Well, the origin story. So let's just tell the origin story again. Yeah. Um, and and even when they don't do that, it still has to be some sort of really epic story where oh we get to see the person as their um, you know as their secret identity for just as much as we get to see them as their superhero character. And you can watch plenty of episodes of of the Justice League show where you know we it, it focuses on all of them or just one of them, and we never have to see them do both roles equally yeah um you know they can tell stories of different scale so it's just it's just a more satisfying whole like what 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 christmas episode is better than the comfort and joy episode of justice uh the justice league what was it season one or season two where martian manhunter goes to uh clark kent's house for the holidays (laughs) john stewart and hot girl go to another planet and get into a bar fight and uh and then flash and ultra humanite have that story with uh the quacky duck guy um and it was like it was like this perfect balance of like secret identity stuff superhero stuff and uh, uh and plus it's just a really great heartwarming story but, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to devil's advocate you now. Okay. Um, now, Hippopotamister is for kids. Yes? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, funny animal stories, they're for kids. Donald Duck, uh, Chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers, it's all kid stuff. The moment you make it animals, you have taken adults off of the plate. You, can, you do not get to market this to adults, right? Because it's funny animal characters after all. Well, I think when you're saying when you bring in marketing, that's not really my I mean it's it's part of my responsibility to take the audience into account, but the method by which the audience gets, you know, reached is is more up to the publisher. Um I I feel like when it comes to parents or or adults, it's it's their decision whether or not they want to get anything out of the story. Like, you know, I, I, it's, but, but, but you like animal stories, right? Yeah. So that means you're a man child. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so what's the, what's the, what's the question here? (laughs) I retract my statements. Do you mind if I play with some Legos while we're doing? <laughs> yeah, you. So I I hear you have an extensive Lego collection. I but, do. Sadly, most of it's not put together. But where most of it's still in boxes. What I'm trying to go with this is that, like, the argument that you can't take on real stories with this. All you can do with animal characters is tell stories of friendship and maybe a little slapstick violence. You can't do anything that actually means anything to the the world at large, right? 
Um, I disagree. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I feel like you can, obviously. Like, is this a point that's, that still needs to be proven with, <laughs> with books like, you know, granted, you can you can take any book that has has animal as animals as lead characters and say, well, it's, you know, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy, and obviously it's it's done that way so that kids can learn a very, very human and very adult uh, lesson without having a direct you know, uh, association or you like made danger a, involved. But. You made a great point in that blog post about, and I thought it was the perfect analogy. You said, uh, worker B finds out one day that, uh, there's too many bees in the hive and he can't, they won't let him come home. And so he goes off looking for a new place to do his bee business. Right. And like to a kid, it's like, are they going like, Oh, this is about, uh, this is about, you know, GM going bankrupt and people getting laid <laughs> off. Right? No, of course they're not. They're just like, oh, this is like what happens on the playground where they're saying, I don't want to play with you anymore. Like the kids that I thought liked me don't like me anymore. Right. But like, but the adults can look and go like, this is about unemployment. Um, yeah. But also, I think of like you mentioned Watership Down a second ago, and somebody in the yeah. chat's mentioning Mouse too. I mean, I mean, yeah, Spiegelman's yeah. Mouse is a good example of this. But Watership Down is not something I would put a four year old in front of. I watched the cartoon. No, no, no. I watched the cartoon when I was like eight. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, like, all right, cartoon rabbits. Oh, 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 God, the fields are covered with blood. What is this? You know? Yeah. So, um, but also, I think you, you, you know, you kind of bring up a point too with the, the notion of, of cartoons where automatically people think cartoons are for kids too. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of, of, you know, cartoons starring human characters that most adults would just write off as being like, Oh, that's for kids. And because it's, because it's a cartoon. So I think there's, there's just this perception, um, which we, we, we know is false that, Oh, if it's a cartoon, it's for kids. Or if it's starring animals, then it's for kids. And I don't feel I don't think we have to prove this, you know, to anyone anymore. <laughs> like, I mean, you can have shows, you can have movies starring puppets, which we're all very familiar with, mm -hmm. that uh, that are appealing, you know, across generations. And it really just comes down to the to the person. Like, if this is a thing that they they like, I mean, there are people that like cartoons, but they don't like anime. So you know, it's all very subjective in the end. Well, I, I think that's very even handed of you to acknowledge like the the individualistic nature of this this argument. But I mean, and I agree that in our circles, this is something we don't need to prove. But I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I came across this where I met somebody. They found out what I did for a living. They're like, oh, have you done anything I might have heard of? Of course, that's the next question they always ask. And then I said, well, no, but I did work on this book uh, about the Kennedy assassination that you can get at bookstores everywhere. And that is like I'm finding that that's always like a great way to make like grownups who don't draw go, oh, well, <laughs> you know, you want to buy history. <laughs> yeah, that's very important. And I go, well, sure. And then they go and then they still followed up with honest to God, John, they said, you ever thought about doing real books? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> that's hey, the what does this person do for a living? <laughs> I don't want to name names, but <laughs> but they they had they had what you call a real job, you know, like a you know you get a, a, a salary and they probably drive a nice car and they dress nice and everything, but um, no no Legos in their house probably. But I'm, I, I'm just saying, like there's there's still we still got some headway to make with this. But okay, but let's go let's go to another interesting place. This that I okay. this, I detected in your essay that I thought was great is you said that uh, a lot of unintended baggage comes with human characters. So yeah. I tell my story, and it's about, um, well, they say write what you know. So I'm going to write about uh, a white kid, boy, who grew up in the country, went to high school, had some friends, got in a little bit of trouble here and there, uh, throw some superpowers on it, boom, we're done. Uh, and then people say, oh, wow, there's uh, not much representation in this comic. Uh, why is, are, is this so far? Where, there's not even a whole lot of women characters in this comic. Um so you can run into problems where people, or, or it's like, well, I grew up in the city. This doesn't mean anything to me because he's growing up in the country. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, like this unintended baggage that you bypass by making a character an animal. Because I think about this a lot when I did Boulder and Fleet. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, it certainly makes, you don't have to worry about things like, 
race and even a lot of times gender like unless you unless there's terminology like him or her yeah. or or names or something you can do stories starring animals and if you never bring that up like no one's going to tell like i mean if you're dressing an animal a certain way then people will make assumptions obviously but you know in my book the animals are naked so <laughs> but i mean they are they are established that they they are guys um but at the same time, if it if it was never mentioned, if it was never brought up, and if I didn't have the the wordplay title of hippopotamister, mm -hmm. then then the animals could be you know any any gender or any race, um, and and I don't know if it's it's not necessarily that that I think I, I chose animals to avoid baggage. Okay, I think it's ju it's just a yeah, it's just a side effect. Right. You know, there's right. it makes it more accessible. And and you know, I want people to read my book. <laughs> so anything that can be done to make it more accessible, I guess is is a bonus. I think you're highlighting something that's important here is that this this was born of the fact that you just like animal character stories in the first place, yeah. right? It wasn't like, all right, now how do I get through to the kids? What do I do? <laughs> right? What, 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 what's the recipe here? All right, well, the kids love the hippos after all, so I'm just going to put a hippo in this and figure out how to make it into something that I actually want to do, right? But you're noticing that there is a fringe benefit of doing animal yeah. characters. And I thought of this, too, is like, you know, with Boulder and Fleet, I'm going to insult, insert my own plug here. But the fleet, the bird, is a girl. But I, the only way we know is that Boulder will refer to her as a her. Yeah. But if you haven't, if that hasn't happened on a page or two, people don't know that. And so some people will say, you know, Fleet's a great character. I just love him. Or, oh, I wish I could be more like her. She's great, you know. So everybody's getting to kind of invest their own gender onto the character if they really want to, which I thought was a, a fascinating thing that I didn't expect, you know. Um we got to get to book recommendations here in a few minutes, but I want to get uh, uh, to some one of your other points in here. Uh, you said, well, I think you kind of covered the whole acting like regular people, but you, you mentioned the universality just a second ago. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could speak to that. Um, and, and I think this universality kind of ties into the universality of the cartoon as well, because, I mean, have you seen um, the, those, those Simpsons paintings of what they would look like if they were real people? Oh, yeah. Or that, that somebody did like actually filmed a Simpsons, the Simpsons opening title sequence with real people, right? And it just feels off when you see that, you know. And when I see the Simpsons as just lines on 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 a screen, I my my heart opens to them. It's like, oh, I love you, Mo Sislak. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to like this this like rendering a character down into these shapes and lines, like. Are you thinking about that when you're designing these characters? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, like, when I design characters, if it's something that I'm going to be drawing, like I want it to be something that is fun to draw. Mm. Not um, like there's, you know, there's fun to draw and difficult to draw, which aren't necessarily in conflict with each other. Like something can be fun and difficult. Um, and something can be boring and, if, or, and easy. And boring and easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh but yeah so with 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 hippopotamister it took it did take a number of tries to settle on the characters uh red panda was kind of easier than hippo um and um and even after kind of settling on final designs uh and and a look for the book after pitching it uh at like even after it was signed and I had a contract, uh, like we changed how the book was going to be drawn and what the hippo character looks like. Mm. Um, it was originally like the style was originally going to be a little more like teen boat. Um, it was going to be inked and they were going to have hard lines and there was going to be a little more angularity to it all. Mm. Um, and now it's, it's all pencil work. Um, uh, and the colors are, are emulating like watercolor, um, and it's, and it's a lot softer and a lot rounder. Um, and there aren't like, I'm not with, with teen boat, everything, like almost every single line in teen boat was drawn with a, uh, a template 
like a like a, a circle template or French curves or oh my blur. god, you're kidding me! Yeah, the entire thing, and and so hippo, I'm not using <laughs> for for hippopotamus. There, I'm not using any straight edges or or templates, and I'm drawing. So it's all all the pencil work is freehand. Um, How which, awesome is that? By the way, that that's got to be that's got to be pretty liberating after doing it. It is. But in some ways, it, it's um, it's more strenuous on my hand um, because sin, also since it's pencil work, um, if I make a mistake and try to erase it, like it's still it like with ink work, you can you can scan it and then you can drop out the pencils. With pencil work, you have to make sure that the actual pencil art is still clean enough. Yeah, that you don't pick up the stuff that you erased. I see. Um, so, and so I have to keep a much steadier hand <laughs> because I'm not relying on a template to lean against yeah. when, I'm, when I'm drawing hippo's snout or something. And like, and it can be a little sketchy. Like there's a little bit of sketchiness to it. Um, but yeah, it took a, it took a while to, to settle on the precise look of them. So, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm looking at pictures of Hippo and Red Panda now, and Hippo is composed entirely of just big, squishy circles, right? There it is. And Red... a, a page. Oh, get, getting a scoop of them yeah. being in a restaurant. Yes, this is, they, they go, uh, one of their jobs is to be chefs. <laughs> so they go to an Italian restaurant. Have, how are you dealing with, I mean, this is just something, this is totally like, uh, oh my gosh, this is such a dumb, nerdy question. I just made fun of people getting upset about lightsabers. But this is one of the things that I run into when doing a story with animal characters is like, how do we solve the whole problem of what do they eat? Like, Anne and I were just watching uh, a Disney Christmas special where Donald Duck in the Huey, Dewey, Louie and Daisy and everybody are sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner and they open up the lid and it's a turkey. And we're like, ah, no, that's 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 <laughs> awful, right? You, birds can't eat birds like that. Not in the cute, yeah, funny animal story. And like you said, it's like it disengages us, so we go. They can do people things and animal things at the same time. But that's one of those things where I get really hung up on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, like, I I realize that well, I guess in the world of Boulder and Fleet, everybody's a vegetarian. They just have to be because it's weird that animals would eat other talking animals. To me, uh, but uh, how well, also in the real world, in the real world, on on chicken plants. They feed the leftover chicken parts back to the chickens. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so really, That's, that is that is terrible. I, I don't want to live there. Uh, I, I'm punching out, John. That's it's more real than you think. <laughs> Donald Duck's world. Oh, thanks for that dose of I want to see Donald go to the chicken or the turkey farm. <laughs> the chicken farm. You know, he goes to the turkey farm. He's picking out the turkey. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And like, and like, and like the Muppet Family Christmas. Like Gonzo has a full conversation with the turkey who's slated to be dinner, right? Yeah. And Gonzo, bless his heart, is trying to get the turkey out of there so they don't have to eat him. But uh, yeah, that's just... maybe it's like maybe it's like the Lion King. You know, they have that whole discussion. That was like that was an elegant way to deal with it. You yeah. know why? Why did the gazelle, you know, come to my crowning ceremony if I'm just going to eat them later? Right, right. Well, they at least at least they dealt with it and tied it in thematically to the plot and everything. But yeah. but this is like a huge. This is one of the few things that my brain trips up on uh, every time. Um, we're going to switch over to book recommendations in just a second. I believe we have a librarian in the house who's going to come in. We're going to talk about some different books that we want other people to read. Uh, but I want to give you the closing thoughts on this, John. Like what, what's, uh, any, any, anything that we missed on this whole thing about what makes animal characters so great? Um, ha. <sighs> If we covered it, we covered I don't know. it. It's it's just hard for me to think of like why aren't they great? <laughs> <laughs> why why is like my favorite version of Spider Man is Spider Ham. Yeah, you know, like He's to me, awesome. you take anything, you take any character existing, and you turn it into an animal, and like to me, it becomes better. Captain America. Like, Captain America is awesome. Uh, yes. Yeah, that was you can take you can take it. What's what what I love even more is superheroes that are like they're based on animals, and then you put them in a universe where they're portrayed by a different animal, 
play like so like spider ham and captain america and and um the incredible hulk bunny is, is incredible hulk bunny right yeah incredible hulk bunny <laughs> like <laughs> but um but the character is like 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 spider-man where it's like he's he's in the real world he's a man with spider powers and then in the animal world he's a pig with spider powers or actually technically his origin is that he was a spider with pig powers um <laughs> that was such a great comic that was such it was a good... so good i don't know why there is not a spider ham cartoon and toy line like it's, you you are spot on with that. I mean, yeah, yeah I don't like, think I don't think a comic would work anymore, but a cartoon totally would work. Yeah, they've tried to relaunch the comic, or or they've done like specials, and they've done variations where like there was one where it was Spider Ham, and then every other Marvel character was also a pig, which to me didn't work. Like if you're gonna do if you're having Wolverine pig instead of wolverine bug or whatever he was yeah um you know the fact that you can't have the characters play off of each other for being different animals makes no sense like oh they're all pigs like that's no that's that... a nightmare that's not a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're all that's pigs. Gonna make that's it... the end of that's the end of willow <laughs> Oh, that's so good. Well, I I think you capped it with that one, John. Uh, we can't we can't beat that as a closing thought. So, with that, we're gonna kick over to book recommendations, and our librarian is here. Uh, people may recognize her, uh, Ann Drozd. Hey, Ann. Oh, you're gonna want to get super tight on these mics, and if they're even on, it, let's try it again. Test, test. There you are. There we go. Hey, Ann. Ann, you know John. Hey, hi, John. How are hi. you? John, I just a voice. nebulous voice. <laughs> Well, you can't see her because of the way we got the camera set up yeah. in here, but she's immediately to my right. So, um, John, I know that I mentioned in email that we might be doing uh, book recommendations on this. I don't know if you had time to prepare any. It doesn't matter if you do or not, um, but uh, we'll let Ann kick off in case you want. Okay. To, okay, cool. So, what do you got, Ann? So, you brought some books, too, I see. I did. All right. I think I'm recommending one that has been recommended many times before on this show, but it fit in with the theme of what you guys are talking about, mm -hmm. animals doing people things. And that so is... we've got Ariel, I and I brought up. Ariel number two, Thunder Horse. <laughs> if you haven't read the Ariel series, which was translated from French. I believe, I, yes. I'm trying to remember now if it was originally released in Belgium or France, but they are fantastic. Uh, they do a terrific job of at least what I remember it being like to be an eight-year-old and getting yeah. around in the adult world and dealing with things that eight-year-olds deal with. Uh, my absolute most oh, favorite... Oh, the trading card one? The trading card, the stickers, actually. Oh, it's trading stickers. It's trading it's like, stickers. I think you've probably already talked about this it, one. It, well, I, I, this is why I think like bringing books back to be recommended again is actually a good idea because it's just underlining it. It's There's saying, also like, have more you not being it released. So if you have already read this one, you can look for other... I think there are uh, up to f number five has been released here in the United States in English. So, but yes, if you, if like, it, even going back to children of the 80s, like me and John, you know, we collected stickers when we were kids. Remember those Panini sticker books, right, John? Yep. Yeah, those were awesome. And so, uh, like, it, it, that, I think that that experience goes all the way to modern day with kids collecting Pokemon cards or any other kind of, like, collectible cards. And there's a, this wonderful story where, yes, he's trying to find the one chase card, and there's a bitter man at the collectible store who tells him, you'll never find it because they don't exist. Well, it's that just goes cross-generational with collecting anything yeah. and trying to get all of everything. So they encounter an elderly dog who is kind of curmudgeonly, <laughs> and he's telling them they're never going to find it. And then... I don't want to spoil the story, though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a series of vignettes. It's a series of short stories about, like, childhood. Yes. And, and, and you mentioned there's an elderly dog in there, and that's another point John was making in his essay, is that you can have animal characters who are old people, and kids won't find them, like, uh, unrelatable, like, as they would, say, you know, that an old person. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, leave it to John. People should go read his blog on Geek Dad. Totally uh, should. All right, so <laughs> what was the other one that you had? The other one that I have is The Gigantic Beard That Was Evil by Stephen Collins. This came out earlier this fall. And should I hand it to you? Oh, yeah, I can, I can take it. So, yeah. So this is a beautifully drawn book. It's entirely drawn in pencil and with graphite shading. And... There, here we go. And it's 
a sardonic fable about society and fitting in and being different and what happens when things go wrong. And what's really weird about this book, it has this odd feel, kind of like a Tim Burton movie, where it's timeless. But then there's one aspect of the story that kind of makes you wonder if it's a dystopian future or if it's a little bit beyond today um, or if it's in the past because the main character Dave who grows the gigantic beard that was evil he listens to the bangles and he only listens to one song eternal flame over and over when he's drawing and hanging out and so the bangles play a big part of the story and it's just the one weird thing that kind of made it seem like maybe this is a dystopian future and maybe he just found a cassette tape of the bangles and he gets to listen to them over and over but (laughs) Again, this story is it's just beautifully drawn and the drawings are poetry and the words are written as poetry where the narrator is beginning the story at the beginning. Um, beautiful book. I just highly recommend it. <laughs> you, you, you've spoken very highly of it at home too. Uh, yeah, in, uh, that's by Stephen Collins and who published it? Picador? Picador. Picador, the gigantic beard that was evil. And we got to hang out with Stephen Collins while we were in New York in November. He he's a, he's he's a, a nice very guy. charming man and very humble. Charming, huh? He was very charming. I <laughs> talked to him at a party for a long time when you were on the other side of the room. <laughs> okay, so for mine, I'm going to pull out some ones that I've re- recommended in the past. Um, if you like animals doing people things, Nemo Nemo, you can't go wrong with that one. And that's it's about stuffed pups who come to life and get into all sorts of misadventures. And it's by Scott uh, Yoshinaga and Audrey Ferrarici. Beautifully drawn, but it's also just, I mean, if you're a fan of Calvin and Hobbes, if you're a fan of Snoopy, if you're a fan of Garfield, all those kinds of uh, animal animal cuteness with really, really funny character-driven comedy, uh, I think that you can't go wrong with this. And this is like volume six. There's a bunch of volumes in the series. It's a webcomic. It's at nemu-nemu.com. But they also have a whole bunch of volumes out that you can purchase and in, I think it'd make an awesome Christmas gift, actually, or holiday gift, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, of course, you have to also mention, since we're talking about animals doing people things, Jake Parker's Missile Mouse. Which hey, is... hey, that's, that's what I was going to Well, let's both talk about it. What do you love about Missile Mouse, John? <laughs> okay, so, so everyone got a good shot. This is the <laughs> second book. I think that is the third one out. I think the third one's out. I think so. Um, but so, so when I was in like uh, middle school and, and high school, so I was, I was like already making my own comics, but I was a big uh, Usagi Yojimbo fan, um, you know, the Samurai Rabbit. And, <clears throat> um, you know, being such a, such a fan, I wanted to make a, a comic kind of in that vein. And so I made a, uh, I co-created with a friend um, this comic of, uh, an, an, a team of animals that were like cyborgs. Um, and they were, uh, private investigators slash bounty hunters slash, um, you know, space farers. Um, so just and, merging and, everything never... you love into one comic with animals. Yes. Basically. Everything I love in, yeah. the, in the one comic. Um, and it was, um, like I didn't, I didn't, I never had a chance to make too much out of it. Like this really, this, this started like at the beginning of high school when I was working on it. Um, and then just at that point in your life, a lot of other things get in the way. Um, but so Missile Mouse is actually like the closest thing uh, that, that reminds me of this, this book that, uh, this comic that I had been trying to create when I was in high school. Um, and it's, you know, it's about this mouse so my team had, there was a mouse on my team um, and a snake and a bear and a chameleon and a snail. Um, <clears throat> and they were all cyborgs and they had like additional, you know, limbs or guns or whatever and things. Um, but this is about this mouse that is like a space bearing, um, you know, hero slash bounty hunter slash space ranger of sorts. Um, and he goes to different planets and he encounters species that some of them are alien like and some of them are animal like um and it's you know it's high adventure and it's drawn in in you know a very like clean style and it, and it reads very easily um and it's action packed and it and it's it's I, I put it in the same category of of books like Usagi Yojimbo and, yeah. and even 
um, the, the original Spider-Ham books in terms of like that level of quality and, and draftsmanship, the way it's drawn. I just love it. Yeah. And, and I mean, in terms of like the content itself, uh, Jake himself has said on this very show that it's basically uh, Indiana Jones, but with a mouse yeah. in space. So if you're a fan of the Indiana Jones movies, you will enjoy Missile Mouse. And also, if you are a fan of nerdy diagrams... Uh, one of the things yeah. he does in his books is he takes all of his characters and vehicles and world building stuff and he gives you all of these awesome cutaways so you can see how everything in his universe works very thought through. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, get this from Scholastic, Missile Mouse. And uh, did you have any other ones you want to recommend, John? Uh, well, there's... Um... Okay. All right. There's Incredible Change Bots, which I love. <laughs> So if anyone wants more books about uh, uh, robots changing into vehicles and stuff, and, and especially if you're a child of the 80s, yeah. uh, I can't recommend this high enough. Jersey, for you, it might be a little too cynical. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, it's tainting my wholesome view of Transformers. Where it's like, there's no. really nothing offensive in this. No, well, it's just... <laughs> there is a lights out love scene. But uh, yes. uh, no, but one of the things I do love about it that I think Jeffrey Brown hit like right in the nail on the head is he drew it as it, it looked exactly like the kinds of Transformers comics I was making in my notebook when I was in eighth grade because he yeah, colored it with markers. Like the marker bleeding through the paper and everything. Yeah, it's, it's very well done. Like that that emulation of if he made that when he was in ninth grade, this is what it would look like. Yes. So I mean, that, so while it does have it is a little edgy. Uh, yeah. the, the thing I got from it was is it transported me to being in 8th grade and being like yeah. well if I drew Transformers this is what it would be like so uh, yeah Incredible Chains Bots by Jeffrey Brown uh, I'm, I'm agreeing with you it's a good book <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then I got one more plug I want to make in this one. There are talking animals in this actually. It's not a funny animal book but there are talking animals um, Greg shegel has been on the show a bunch of times friend of mine uh we love him he did this book called picks one weirdest weekend which is about a girl with a teenage girl with superpowers who claims to be a fairy princess and uh it's i mean it's so good that i blurbed it but uh there is a talking bear and a talking monkey who fights the talking bear in it which is pretty great uh and i just dropped in the podcast feed episode 100 of the comics great show where greg was on it and uh you can listen to us talk about the book in more detail there but uh, this book is now uh, up for pre-order in previews, the previews catalog uh, for the month of December. And the item number, I want people to write this down, is DEC141546. Or you can go to PixComic.com to get that number. Uh, and if you order your comics through previews, do get this book and get a couple copies for you and a friend. And you can also get it at PixComic.com. Uh, Pix I so, designed his font. Did you really? Yes, in the, oh. for that book, yeah. That's that's another thing we didn't even get to talk about. That you design fonts as a as a part time income stream. Uh, we'll have to have you back to talk about that a little bit yeah, because yeah. I think that's a fascinating subject: sound design and font design. And maybe we can even get him at the uh, the Web Comics Lab to talk about it too. Maybe we can pull his arm. Maybe we could pull his arm. So that that leads me to uh, events. We got a couple events coming up that we need to make noise about, Ann. We do. Um, you just mentioned Web Comics Lab. We have the December Web Comics Lab is next Wednesday and. A local cartoonist, Carolyn Nowak, will be our special guest, and she has a webcomic, Lazy, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. It's a slice of life. It's from her life. Mm -hmm. And then we also have... Oh, uh, well, she also has done work on Lumberjanes, too, right? She did. Um, she did a cover for number 10. I think they have variant covers. So and and she recently did some out. work for Cartoon Network as she well. She did that as well. Fabulously talented cartoonist, and uh, I'm sure we're going to benefit a lot from uh, anything that she has to share. And that's Wednesday, December 10th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Mallets Creek Branch. Uh, it's a writer's group for cartoonists. So if you are an aspiring professional or a professional and just want to get together with some other creative people and share some of the work that you're working on, that's the place to go. Mallets Creek, December 10th, 6 to 8 p.m. And then we got... So Carolyn will be available... For questions too, so please bring any questions about work that you are working on yeah. right now or that is future work. And then the other thing we got is something that actually features artwork that you did. Yes, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. This is super cool. So uh, everybody knows that the Kids Read Comics event is held every summer at the Ann Arbor District Library. It's a big indoor outdoor festival comics convention type dealy. But ADL is branching out to doing more events like this. We are doing more big things here. So. 
On December 13th, we will be hosting Tiny Expo, which is from 11 to 530 p.m. And it will be in the main lobby of the first floor. So right when you walk into the downtown library, you will be in the middle of all the action. We have some great vendors lined up. Um, Tiny Expo has been going on in Ann Arbor. I think this is the fifth year. Oh. Um, so it's been going on for years, but this is the first time it's at the library. So it's previously been in Carytown and in other venues around town. But this is the first time at the library, and we're very excited to have everybody coming here for Tiny Expo. So um, it's it's a arts and crafts kind of arts show. Arts and crafts. So we're going to have all sorts of vendors. We're going to have um, fine artists, prints, um, knitting. Comics. Comics. All sorts of holiday things too um so if you're looking for gifts for the upcoming holiday season please stop by and purchase things from our vendors and get local things and fantastic wonderful crafts and bonus points if you can spot the short circuit reference that ann put into the tiny expo poster <laughs> so yes tinyexpo.com uh that's where you can find uh more information about that or find them on facebook they got an event uh page for that so did i miss anything else ann no i think that's it for Things that are coming up in December. And we'll right. be back with more things because we have some other good guests lined up for the Webcomics Lab coming up next year, too. Yes, big news is going to drop about that. That's pretty cool. Um, oh, wait. I, ha I do have some more exciting news. <laughs> uh, the Ann Arbor District Library has a tools collection. Yes! And we have art tools. And with Tiny Expo coming up and arts and crafts on everybody's mind, we are rolling out more of our art tools. So Art tools, what do you mean? You're going to give me a paintbrush or something? Pencils? I can get no, that in an office we're going to give store. you some fantastic things that you can't use elsewhere. So for the <laughs> Webcomics Lab, we started trying out some Wacom tablets, the Intuos Pro, the really large tablet, and then Intuos Medium Touch mm -hmm. and Pen. I don't I don't know if I'm getting the name right. Graphics but tablets. Graphics tablets. So if you've ever wanted to try out a Wacom tablet... Now is going to be your chance. So starting in a couple of weeks, um, hopefully at Tiny Expo, we will have these available with demos and people can check them out. There will also be spinning wheels and sewing machines <laughs> and a few other surprises. That is so cool. The, the library lends out Wacom tablets as well as spinning wheels, sewing machines, microscopes, telescopes. What what else? Like music tools? Games. You can get a life-size human skeleton You, you can check out a life-size human skeleton from the library. That is so cool. Yes. Uh, and and is, there, is there a landing page for this yet? Well, you can go to the Unusual Stuff page, which is, I'm probably going to get the URL wrong, but if you go to the catalog and look at the browse options, there is a link to Unusual Stuff, and that will take you to the page that's going to tell you all about all of the amazing things you can get with your library card. You guys are doing some really great stuff here. So, uh, okay, well, cool. Well, thank you, Anne, for the book recommendations and for the updates on the uh, upcoming events. John, if people think, first of all, thank you so much for making time to do this thing with sure, me today. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad we finally got you on the show. Secondly, what is the one thing you want people to check out today? After people w watch the show, listen to it, they're like, that John guy, he's really smart. Uh, I want them to find out more about him. Where should they go? Uh, <laughs> Google. <laughs> I don't know. I'm horrible at maintaining my own website. Um, so I guess if you if you Google me and you weed out all the other John Greens, <laughs> you'll you'll find me and content that I put up. But you can I mean John Green art at at, at the Twitters mm -hmm. and um, you know the, the, there is that that website and I'm on the Facebooks and I don't really tumble. Yeah. Um, I guess I should, but but you know I don't. Um, the, the, the opinions <laughs> I'm are horrible at, at maintaining an, an online presence. Really, I, I'm trying to think where I see you the most active, and I think the most stuff I see from you comes on Facebook. Uh -huh. Yeah, probably on Facebook. Yeah, because I don't see you that active on Twitter, and I never see you on Tumblr. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But I'm I'm just as I'm just as guilty, you know. I I'm not that active on uh, Twitter, and uh, I got books to draw. Yeah. Yeah, I got I got books to draw and cartoons to watch, right? Yeah. So All right. Uh 
Well, cool. Well, thank you, John, once again for being part of the show. Thanks to Andros of comics.aadl.org for the book recommendations. Thanks to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room for uh, knitting this whole weird thing together. We're going to be back in two weeks. In two weeks, December 17th, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to stream another live show, final one of the year. It's going to be an all-book recommendation show. We're going to follow our tradition of having Dave Roman and Raina Telgemeier on to do comics for the holidays. So if you're looking for a last-minute comic gift to get somebody that's the one to tune into it's gonna be a rapid fire discussion where we're gonna mention like what 50 60 books on the show probably maybe more yeah actually maybe more so all right the show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash cag107 if you enjoyed it if you had fun listening to it a great way you can thank the show is to go to the itunes and and give it a star review however many stars you think it deserves you don't even have to write a review although if you write one that makes me happy or if you're watching this on youtube give it a thumbs up that helps more people find the show uh so thanks everybody for downloading watching and listening until next time i've been jersey drozd of comicsagreat.com and jersey on twitter okay bye Oh, that's right. I should see this. And you're supposed to do that too. Dex, Dex, Dex.